All right, it's time to talk about one of my favorite films, 12 Monkeys. I love Terry Gilliam. I think he's a great director. And of course, 12 Monkeys is probably his best film. This is the most relevant film that I could think of for the here and the now, for what we're experiencing in this present situation. I'd also recommend go check out Aaron and Melissa Dykes' analysis of 12 Monkeys, their video I will link below. It's also relevant to this. Um, they have a really uh, powerful take in the midst of this scenario. 12 Monkeys is very revelatory. It's very accurate for the dystopia that we seem to be living in the midst of right now. So 1997, we see Bruce Willis noticing, and, and well, we, we see the film starting with 1997 and saying that there will be $5 billion gone from some release, some future uh, scenario. Right. And then we see the remaining people after this period underground. They live in underground bases. They're all caged. Everybody lives in this kind of lab rat scenario under a strict technocratic situation. The scientism elite that rule them, they they look through these giant sort of ocular lenses and they zoom in. And we see the uh, ever present gaze of the all seeing eye throughout the film. Meanwhile, on the surface, the Earth has turned to a rewilding scenario where animals uh, formerly in zoos are now roaming free. The city has been rewilded. There's, you know, uh, weeds and growths everywhere, uh, even in the midst of giant museums. Right. So there's a lot of irony here in that in the midst of these these hotels and in the midst of these libraries, universities, government buildings and malls, we see the return of nature. And this, we think, is due to a death cult. Right? There's a group of radical eco-activists, the 12 Monkeys, who we think is behind this. And in a way, they kind of play a role in this domino series of events that lead to this scenario. But uh, spoiler alert, it's not really the 12 Monkeys that uh, are behind this, although they do play a role. We see uh, Bruce Willis is sent, uh, you know, up to the top uh, from this underground base to collect uh, spores, to collect uh, samples, to collect bugs and whatnot, to help the scientist down below. And he's under some kind of prison sentence for something, probably some innocuous offense that goes against the Orwellian system that he lives under. And so uh, in this scenario, he has to constantly be under this sort of mental uh, scientism surveillance and study program, right? So he himself is being studied in the midst of this. So there's studies going on about the studies. It's, it's almost a meta level of, of uh, scientific bureaucratic obsession. So Bruce Willis uh, it reports back, of course, and he tells them he doesn't know what's going on. And they say, well, we're, we're going to have to put you into this program that will send you back in time. We're going to send you back in time before the 1997 event, and we're going to find out what was really going on, right? And so um, Bruce Willis is sent back, uh, and he arrives in a mental ward. And this is interesting because we don't exactly know what is real and what's in Bruce's head for a good period of this section of the film, right? Uh, when they put him in the mental ward after he... He initially uh, shows up nude and freaking out or whatever. Uh, he starts to hear these voices, right? What are you doing, Bob? How's you going, Bob? Right? And who, we don't know who this is. Is this one of the scientists in the future that's speaking to him and that he actually has a chip in his tooth or something like this? Or is this in his head? Is it somebody in the cell next to him, right? We don't know. This is one of the aspects of the film that's interesting because it does kind of leave this up in the air for you to debate. But what's interesting is that this is talking about MK Ultra, And if you doubt me, later on in the film, when this comes up, there's a specific mention by one of these voices that speaks to him that there's a, a building that they do tests on people, right? He says, down the road, there's a building, they take people and they do tests on them. We even wonder if perhaps some of the homeless people might be individuals who underwent these tests. So the film leaves it a little bit ambiguous, in my view. You, I could be wrong. It could be really, really clear. And there's perhaps some, some detail that I'm missing. But I think the film leaves it up in the air that um, 
we're never fully clear if the crazy people that we see throughout the film, the street preacher, the bums, right? Um, are they actually crazy or have they been put into experiments or have they, or are they sort of conduits for these messages from the future? And Bruce Willis himself kind of gets confused about this, right? Now, uh, it's interesting that he's in a mental institute initially. So they put him in the mental institute and this is where he meets Jeffrey, the Brad Pitt character, who's you know, got that crazy eye and he's he's really playing it well. I mean, he plays it perfectly. And by the way, why does every mental institute play cartoons? Hello, maybe cartoons are fostering the madness in all the crazy people. <laughs> Please, I would like to petition all mental institutes, stop playing cartoons. Maybe this is agitating, right? Um, but then again, maybe some mental institutes aren't really there to help and heal. Maybe some mental institutes are there for testing purposes. I think that's hinted at in this film. And in fact, one of the key questions that's raised in this film by Gilliam is scientism, the scientific process, trusting psychology and scientism over intuition, over common sense, over our own experience and reasoning. And if we can in fact be duped by big scale scientism questions, are we under a scientific dictatorship, a scientific elite? That's the real issue, I think, that that uh, Gilliam is, is raising here. And I think he's right. I think that the modern world has a superstitious attachment to scientism and the scientific elite, as if that was a new priesthood. Right? This has been discussed in many of the elite books that we've covered, Bertrand Russell, uh, all the way back to Foucault, uh, even uh, Aldous Huxley, right? the, the scientism elite, the priests in lab coats, right? This is something that goes, again, back to Foucault. So, Gilliam wants us to pay attention to a future ruled by scientism, where everything is tracked and traced, where you are insane if you're a conspiracy, conspirafoil theorist, where you, if you have anything out of the ordinary happen, the solution is some kind of medicine or... Uh, behaviorist programming, right? Behaviorism comes up a lot in this. Watson, Pavlov, that kind of stuff. Uh, that dominates this film. Now, there's a lot of interesting elements that pop up too that uh, suggest things like the apocalypse, right? Is this actually the apocalypse? Um, I don't think in the film we're supposed to really believe that, well, actually, you could argue that it's both, right? It's In a sense, it's the apocalypse, in the, in the event of, you know, billions being exterminated. In another sense, it's also an individual apocalypse on the uh, part of Bruce Willis himself, because as you know, the film ends with Bruce Willis seeing his own death, right? Because he's stuck in this time loop. Uh, he's stuck in a rut of, you know, what Matthew McConaughey talks about, like, have you ever seen a flat circle, the shack goes here, right? He... Matthew McConaughey in True Detective is talking about the same idea of the Nietzsche and eternal return, right? Being stuck in that, that uh, loop that everything that's happened will happen and will always happen, right? Eternal return, the, the Nietzschean cyclical pagan Greek view of history. Now, there's other details, I, I think, that um, give credence to two strands of interpretation of the film. Um, I think you could uh, perhaps argue that the events of Bruce Willis uh, are, are made up. There's some of these things could be in his head. Uh, for example, the scientist at the end, she says she's in insurance. She's in insurance. So um, if she's in insurance, how does she end up as a scientist in the future, right, when Bruce Willis at the beginning is being sent to the past? Um, why does Bruce Willis seem to just pop out of existence go back to the future and then come back, right? So then we get the alternate timelines thing. And I think there's good questions you could raise either way. I think the tenants, the, the more evidence is on the side of Bruce Willis actually going back in time. I do think that that's true because of so many examples of with uh, with Madeline Stowe, right? Where he he's uh, the, the soldier in the in the battle uh, in the old, in the textbook, right? Um, and then we have, you know, the, the cartoon that he's watching. It's it's the Woody Woodpecker episode where Woody Woodpecker goes back in time, right? So there's a lot of clues that do suggest that 
But what we really want to focus on is not so much the debatable aspects of the narrative, but the insights and the critiques of society that Gilliam is offering, particularly the critiques not just of scientism, but also things like these radical groups. Are these radical groups tools? In the film, they're not necessarily a tool of a bigger power, but the real power isn't Jeffrey and his troop of idiots. The real power is Jeffrey's dad, who is a, I think he's some kind of senator or something, and he owns some giant bio lab, right? some giant body odor lab. Uh, uh, and um, the scientism elite that work there, the ponytail dude, right? Uh, he has a radical dysgenic worldview. And so he is, of course, the one that's actually behind the scenario, the release scenario. But the animal rights group, the radical vegan activists, notice that they are radical vegan animal rights activists. And they even want to engage in eco-terror, you see. Um, because of this, this, the power that Jeffrey's dad has as a, a company owner, a CEO, senator guy, Jeffrey sees him as a kind of God figure that he says he has to rebel against. So Jeffrey sees himself, oddly enough, as this sort of Lucifer Satan figure who is sparking the revolution, sparking the rebellion. Um, and he, in his, his mind, he needs to end humanity, right? Um, he doesn't actually do this, right? His, his whole plan was just to release the animals from the zoo, right? That was the, the great irony was that that wasn't even his plan. It was just to free animals from the zoo. But there's a curious section where in one of Jeffrey's rants, not only does he mention the GMOs and the, the ability to create bio uh, agents that could be very dangerous through genetic modification, um, he also mentions the dangers of the ability to track and trace and use predictive algorithmic tracking. Uh, when they're in their little pet store slash bunker, the, the 12 Monkeys crew, Jeffrey goes into a rant about how he thinks that the elite have used him as a test subject to actually map out his mind and through a supercomputer, try to figure out all the possible scenarios of choices that he would make so that they could know where he would go and what to do and that he's a test subject. It's entirely possible, I'm just throwing this out as a theory, that perhaps Jeffrey is right. Maybe Jeffrey actually was because his dad was a powerful corporate guy and a, a, a you know deep state kind of connected guy, perhaps Jeffrey's dad perhaps put him through experiments, right? And so perhaps like Bruce Willis, they were together in some kind of series of uh, experimentation. Perhaps that's how they know each other from the mental ward. Just a possible interpretation, but what Jeffrey talks about is kind of what they do with the global brain and with Google, right? With the sort of mimicking and modeling of uh, within these simulations that are run in the supercomputers. So that actually is real. That's come out nowadays. We know this kind of stuff does to some degree exist. Uh, again, very curious that this was in the the film. Uh, what is this, 1995, four or five, somewhere in there. Um, and you have the Brad Pitt character talking about this. So um, I think the weight, as I said, of the evidence relies lies in the, the side of it being a real scenario where, where Bruce Willis is time traveling. It's trying to raise the, the age old questions that uh, science fiction films often do about free will and determinism, eternal return and Nietzsche. Um, how do we interpret reality? How do we do pattern recognition? What's valid pattern recognition and what's invalid? How do we categorize the, the patterns that we, that we recognize into a narrative structure. I actually think all those questions are being asked in this film. And can science actually give us narratives? Or is science just bare facts that don't give us any narrative or meaning? If you watched other Terry Gilliam films, that's a pretty consistent narrative. You see that in Dr. Parnassus, right? Because part of the, the narrative of Dr. Parnassus is that nobody's telling stories anymore, right? Where are the stories, right? And so the Heath Ledger and the actors, they are storytellers and they're they're not as important perhaps as they once were, uh, uh, you know, in the Renaissance or something like that. Now, of course, uh, we know that in our day, actors are these 
uh, uh, fronts for different, uh, you know, faux movements, right? They're kind of uh, PR fronts is what they operate as now, but um, they're not, they're not really storytellers, which is what the, uh, what, what uh, Parna- the Dr. Parnassus, imaginary of Dr. Parnassus was trying to get at. So I think here um, we have really interesting questions being raised about um, the interpretation of reality, the schema that we use to interpret reality, whether it's stories or scientism, the, um, the questions of can we convince other people to be part of our own delusions? That's a very fascinating question because between Madeline Stowe and Bruce Willis, they're kind of back and forth on this and they, they switch back and forth to believing and disbelieving each other's narratives. Um, Vertigo comes up as well, which is interesting because in Vertigo, the Jimmy Stewart character, if you recall, uh, after his trauma scenario, he enters into a hospital and there's a sequence that there's a sequence of Jimmy Stewart where where you are, he seems to almost go through a kind of dissociation, right? Is he dissociating? Uh, uh, you, there's that famous scene, right, in the in the Hitchcock film where he's like his face is flying at you, and there's all this you know spinning uh, uh, spirals behind his head, and it's very psychedelic. And so, is he undergoing some kind of testing scenario as well? Because afterwards, we see the sequence where Jimmy Stewart walks up to the tree with is it Kim Novak, I think, and they point at their spots on the timeline of the big tree that's cut, right? And she says, I'm here, you're here. And if you think about it, the the the, the if you dissect the tree, right, if you cut it and you've got the, the different years in the, in the tree rings, that's also a big flat circle, isn't it? You know, that's the eternal return idea. And that already begins to prepare Bruce Willis for his coming death, where when he dies, he has to see his own self as a child. And so is this all flashing, his life flashing before his eyes, right, as he dies? Um, But regardless, the dissociation aspects, the mind control aspects are definitely there. They're actually mentioned, especially with the voices and the possibility of the chip that he has in his tooth. Um, the, uh, The notion of scripted reality the notion of these phony eco groups and these these uh, tools like uh, Jeffrey's Twelve Monkeys, which we're all monkeys, you see, we're all parts uh, participants in a giant global experiment. That's interesting because that's exactly what Neil deGrasse McTyson just said the other day, didn't he? He said we are all in a giant experiment, and the test is to see who will believe science or not. So you better listen to your priests in lab coats. This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. Please check out Aaron and Melissa's analysis of 12 Monkeys as well. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Be sure to like and share. And next up, we're going to do a video relating to the best, I don't know, top 11, 12, 13 viral outbreak type movies to watch in your quarantine.